additional information. A. At the end of 20x3, a division of the company was sold. As a result of this, a large number of the employees of that division opted to transfer their accumulated pension entitlements to their new employer's plan. Assets with a, assets with a fair value of $48,000 were transferred to the other company's plan. And the actuary has calculated that the reduction in BCD's defined benefit liability is $50,000. The year end valuations in the table above were carried out before the transfer was recorded. B. At the end of the 20x4, a decision was taken to make a one off additional payment to former employees currently receiving pensions from the plan. This was announced to the former employees before the year end. This payment was not allowed for in the original terms of the plan. The actuarial valuation of the obligation in the table above includes the additional liability of $40,000 relating to these additional payments required. Show how the reporting entity should account for this Define benefit plan in each year, 20x2, 20x3, and 20x4. Thank you very much. I want you guys to discuss or resonate on that question for the next five minutes before I try to provide suggested solution. Okay, we are back at the question after a series of deliberation by the team. Now, our discussion here will more or less be the final habitat to understanding what is required of us. Okay. This is a template of try to develop to solving the problem. Now, based on this information, the first thing is to extract relevant information. The fair value of the plant asset as at the beginning of the period 2012 was said to be the same with the plant obligation, 1 million each. Please take note of every step I take. We are told it is the same thing as the liability, 1 million each. The contribution made at the end of the year as assumed in the question, where one thing in thousands, one twenty, and one twenty. Benefit paid was 120, 140, and 150. Client service cost, 140, 150, and 150. Discount rates, we are given that each year is 10%, even though it might vary from year to year. But in this case, it's 10% across board. As at the end of each year, 
they obtain the present value based on actuarial valuation using the periodic unit credit method to obtain 1.2 million at the end of year one. One million six fifty thousand at the end of year two, and one million seven hundred thousand at the end of year three. Furthermore, okay, I think that is for the liability. Why for the assets, the fair value based on portfolio valuation was one million two fifty thousand in year one. One million six four fifty. One million four fifty in year two, and one million six ten in year three. Now I'll put question mark here because these other ones were not given to us. Who can give vividly tell me how we can get all this within this question mark in red? How do you get it? If you have sound understanding of accounting, finance, and bringing balance from last year to this year, what will have been our value because we're not given expressly? I want to believe it to be the prior year balance which Thank is you. Not likely going to be the- Thank you. Uh, the prior year balance, which means the opening balance in 2013 automatically must be closing balance in 2012 for the assets. Am I right? Yes, sir. Which means this is 1.2. In 2014, it will be closing balance in 2013. Yeah. That is it. Likewise for liability. 150 and this. Yeah, I think this is called the uh corkscrew method i can't remember if i'm correct i don't know if i'm correct that what corkscrew method bringing back uh closing balance of the previous year yes that is the fundamental of accounting except overnight if rats has eaten your money that what you close to it will not be open with okay that is the first assignment here now we have been able to populate this. Okay, what other information was given to us? Uh, additional information in the books, which we are going to address. Now, the two additional information given to us has nothing to do with 2012, which means in 2012, we can go ahead without consideration of that adjustment to solve our problems. Now, how do I solve our problem? The first thing is that in 2012, I need to fair value my plan assets. And I will start with my opening balance in 2012, which is 1 million. All these figures, I'll put it to the nearest. Therefore, we have 1 million. The expected return is based on the discount rate at the end of each year multiplied by the opening balance at the beginning of each year, assuming there is no intermittent cash flows. That is what it means. Take note of that. Let me put it in red as a reference. Therefore, what is the product of my discount? My discount rate is 10%. The discount rate may change, and in practice, it will change year in, year out because it's based on the yield 
on government bond at the end of each year. And I barely agree to the fact that yield year on year will be exactly the same. Take note of that. Okay, sir. The discount rate multiplied by opening balance is this, 100,000. The contribution made will increase our investment. How much was made? One third in that year. Next, there was settlement in that year. No, there was no settlement. Next, there were benefits paid to retirees in that year, which reduced our asset because we have to realize our asset to settle that obligation. Invariably, the sum of these should give us our obligation at the end of the year. All things being equal. equal. Now, but as at the end of the year, when our portfolio manager fair value the portfolio of our investment in the plant asset, it was valued at one million two fifty. The question then is: Is there a gain or loss from the portfolio valuation? Is there a gain or loss? Um, you expect your value of portfolio, your asset to be 1 million and 90, but actually it is 1 million 250 based on market valuation. Are you at a gain or at a loss? Is that a gain? Yeah, a gain of how much? 160,000. Ignore the signs. The signs is just the order. But what matter is when it's in negative as it is here because your portfolio valuation actually is greater than your expectation. Therefore, you have made gain of 160. This gain of 160 will come here as gain on the measurement of plan assets. Therefore, what is my gain? My gain will reduce my loss. I think that's there. Now, this is that, which means the closing balance here will be my opening balance here. Last year, 2013, I still go to the present value for 2012 for liability. For the liability, our present value brought forward It's one million from the information in the question. Now, similar to what we have done or before then, our current service cost to that one fourth. Our interest cost, similar to what we have done here, is based on the discount on the opening balance. Assuming there's no intermittent cash flows, I put it in red as a way of emphasizing on it. Therefore, that is a product of my discount rate times my opening balance. My past service cost. There were no information of past service cost in this year, therefore it is zero. Settlement was not made in this year regarding containment is zero, but there were benefit paid 
to the tune of 120,000 for those that have retired. All in all, my expected liability should be 1.120. But based on my actuarial valuation, which was obtained from actuary reports, based on the projected unit credit method, what we obtained was 1.2, if I'm not mistaken. Which means you expected your liability to be 1.120, but actually your liability was 1.2. Is it a gain to you or a loss? The loss. It was what? I said it's a loss. It's a loss to you. Okay, which means we had a loss here of 80. And that loss of 80, will be subsumed by the gain we had. Which means net net, what we have in that first year was net loss, net actual loss of, oh, no, sorry, net actual gain of 80,000. Because we have more of gain than what? Than loss. That is that. This is evaluation for the first year, which will carry forward to the second year. In the second year again, our discount rate remain 10%. We calculate 10% of our opening balance. It gives us $125,000. We do the same thing for our interest cost. Our interest cost gives us $120,000. At the end of the day, contribution made in that year by dragging is 120,000. The current service cost in that year was 150,000. And we still have no record of past service cost. And, but in that year, there was containment. Who can read out information A, additional information A on containment? Can somebody read it out? Information on containment. Over to you, Shegu. Shegu, can you read it out? Information on containment. OK, sir. Abimbola, please keep quiet. Over to you. Okay. At the end of 20X3, a division of the company was sold. As a result of this, a large number of the employees of that division opted to transfer their accumulated pension entitlement to their new employer's plan. Assets with a fair value of $48,000 were transferred to the other company's plan. And the actuary has calculated that the reduction in BCD's defined benefit liability is $50,000. The year-end valuations in the table above were carried out before the transfer were recorded. Now, what does that signify? What it signifies is very straightforward, that there was a containment. And the value of the liability when it was quoted was $50,000. Okay, 50,000 was the value of the liability, but that liability was settled for with asset of 48,000. The question is, have you made a gain or loss on this containment? It's a gain. It's a gain, sir. A gain, which yes. means you sold out part of your asset, what, how much? 48,000. Mm -hmm. 48,000 to settle liability of how much? 50,000. Invariably, what has happened is that here, in the time of your containment, there was nothing for 20, there was nothing for 2012. No containment, no settlement. 
But in 2013, you said to you with 48, but your liability that was set to you was 50, which means invariably you have a gain on containment. Don't be kind the way we design. What matters is your understanding of what has happened. How much is your gain on containment? How much is your gain on containment? I can't hear you guys. 2,000. 2,000. OK, let me write it in full, 48,000. And fifty thousand. Okay, take note of that. That two thousand, as a gain, will come here to reduce your pension expense as loss on containment. Take note of that. Okay, let me put this in a color that can relate to. This can relate to what we have here. Okay, that is that. Now the next thing is benefit paid to retiree, 140, 140. Now what is our balance in the plan asset as expected? And what is our balance in the plan liability as expected? Now, what is our actual fair value? It's now 1.450, which you have here for asset and for liability, how much? 1650. Therefore, your expected value of asset is 1.3, but your actual value is 1.4. Is it a gain or a loss? It's another gain of 143. And here, another loss of 370. But who we accept that we are right and who we disagree that we are wrong? I need an answer. I need an answer, please. Are we right in what we have just done or we are wrong? To me, we are right. Why are we right? Because we, we, we take all the necessary steps from beginning to the end to, to, to the period where we determine the expected uh, fair value for plan assets and to the period when we determine expected present value of defined benefits obligation. That's the reason why I said we are right.
Now, there is a technical note here that I'm building up on, and I'll read it out for you. I said, technical note, in 2013, there was a containment that resulted in settlement of the accrued obligation as at the end of 2013. But the liability sorry, in this case, it's not liability. But the fair value of the plan assets had so been determined for the enforced employee. Enforced employee means employee that are yet to retire before the value of containment was obtained. Hence, the amount of the settlement should be deducted from the actual value as thus, which means the $1,450,000 already included that 48. Since you have now taken the 48 out to settle, you must deduct it, which means if the actual valuation or portfolio valuation was done after, the settlement, it will have considered it to arrive at 402, 1 million 402, not 1 million 450. Therefore, we should remove it so that we avoid double count. And that's what we have done there. Do you get it? And I, this was what one of you was discussing when you had your own interaction on how do we account for that? Which means invariably here, we need to take note that this 1450 is not 1450, it's 1450 minus the 48 that was curtailed. And this is only when we are right. Similarly, this will be done for the liability because both are the actuarial valuation. Therefore, I copy and paste, but at different amounts. Therefore, I'll change the narrative here as follows. Technical note, in 2013, there was a containment that resulted in settlement of accrued obligation as at the end of the year. But the present value of the defined benefit obligation had been so determined for the enforced employee before the value of containment was obtained. Hence, the amount of settlement should be deducted from the actual value as does. The actual value is 1.650, and the liability curtailed was 50. When you remove that, you have 1.6 million. That is that. Which means here, similar to what we have there, you also curtail it, you remove the liability curtail, which is 50 from it, and that will give you 1.6 million. Take note of that. Any question on that? 
Uh, please, I would just like you to throw more light on this uh, additional information. A, uh, the opening paragraph there that said, at the end of 2013, a division of the company was sold. As a result of this, a large number of the employees of the division opted to transfer their accumulated pension entitlements to the new employer's plan. I know that they opted to transfer, but the fact that the division was sold is a little bit confusing for me because this uh, selling of the division is at the instance of the management. It's not the fault of the employee, so they shouldn't bear the bonds even though they opted to transfer to another employer. Uh, you know, we can't query what employer and employers agreed. Do you get what I'm saying now? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. We are not here to justify the economic decision. We are here to account for what has been agreed by two parties, the employer and the employee. And take note, the employer might have even surveyed the position that if this is not taken and the division is allowed to collapse on its own, probably you might even suffer more loss or probably they want to cut salary or want to more or less make amendments to that plan that will reduce the benefit in future. Therefore, people now say our bread is better than none. Let us go and move on. And there's no material difference or loss from you taking $48,000 in lieu of $50,000. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Perfectly. Okay. That is that. Now, let us now move to the, okay, before moving to the next year, let us show what is our current service cost in year 2012 is 140. In 2013, it is 150. Net interest income and expense. we we'll come here, what is our net interest cost? Our net interest cost is 100 and we deduct our expected return, which is also 100. This is the same because they both have the same open balance, given that this, the same discount rate is what is applicable. Now it is this 100 minus 100 that gave us a zero coming here as net interest cost. Okay, but in the second year, it is not the same because the liability and the assets are not the same. Therefore, our net interest cost here is more of a return, which is 5,000. And that return will come here to reduce our pension cost. That's why this is negative to reduce. Okay. What is our actuarial value? As at the end of the day, we also show it here. In the second year, there was humongous loss of 320 and 95. At the end of the day, when you net it off, what is our net impact of our actuarial valuation? And it will be the difference between 320 and 95, okay, which is 225. Okay, that 225 is what goes to our other comprehensive word, income. Okay, now what is our actual liability at end of each year? It's based on this following valuation. This is for our obligation will come first and we we'll deduct our asset from it. In this case, we have net of assets. And when you have net of assets, you need to be careful because you need to subject it to asset ceiling test. And we are going to discuss that as we move on. Now, in the second year, what do we have? We have 198. And 198 is the difference between the defined benefit obligation of 1.6 and the actual fair value of the plant asset of 1.4 which means our plant asset, net plant asset, or net retirement benefit asset has now turned to net 
defined benefit obligation within the space of one year. Now let's do the final year. In the final year for assets, your closing balance in year 2013 will be your opening in year 2014. Our expected return is still the discount rate multiplied by our opening balance, 10%. Contribution was made, which was 120,000. There was no settlement in this period, okay? And benefit paid to retirees in this period Benefit paid to retiree this period was 150,000. Invariably, what is our balance? 1.52. But based on our valuation, what was our balance as at the end of year three? It's 1.61. Therefore, do we see have gain? We still reported gain of 97,800. Now let's look at our liability. Our closing liability is 1.6. Now, our client service cost from the information provider is 150. Our interest cost is based on the discount times opening balance at 10%. Our past service cost. Can you read information B here on past service cost? Okay, sir. Can somebody read that? Yes, sir. Information B. At the end of 20X4, a decision was taken to make a one-off additional payment to former employees currently receiving pensions from the plan. This was announced to the former employees before the year end. The payment was not allowed for in the original terms of the plan. The actuarial valuation of the obligation in the table above includes the additional liability of $40,000 relating to the additional payment. To Thank you very much. Now it includes means that valuation report has also included that amount. If it has not included that amount, what we'll have done is to include it by adding it, which is opposite of the deduction we made there. Okay, therefore, what do we do? There's a past service cost. There's a past service cost of how much? Past service cost of $40,000. There was no settlement. And what was the benefit paid? Sorry. Benefit paid, if we drag it, is 150. Thereafter, our expected defined benefit obligation is 1.8. But actually, what do we have in our books as at the end of the year? It was 1.7. Therefore, what do we have? We have for the first time here, a gain or a measurement of our liability. Okay, even though across our assets, we had a loss. Any question? Any question? Therefore, I come down here to show the effect of that. Now, because there are two gains, the total gain increased by 197, whereas we had loss in this period. Okay, and there was no curtailments and there was no settlement made. Okay, I remember our liability and asset appeared to obtain our net defined benefit liability of 90 at the end of the day. Okay, therefore, what is our pension cost? I can drag this because this is Excel. Therefore, I will pick all my variables. Okay. 150 is our current service cost. No gain or loss on containment. Past service cost for the first time we are recognizing it. And therefore, I'll drag it on 
to show my past service cost of 40,000. Now my interest cost, I have to more or less drag it to also link to the one of 2014, which comes to 19,800. And at the end of the day, we have the following as our solution to it. Any question on it? Take note, the only aspect that is remaining for me to discuss is what I highlight now, which is the aspect that we'll talk on asset ceiling. Asset ceiling test. Okay. Any questions so far? Any questions so far? We don't have questions for now. Maybe when we peruse the solution deeply, by the time you want, you, you are explaining the uh, the call the ceiling with us. Okay, now to... what do we do about this asset ceiling test? Asset ceiling test is saying that before we can recognize fifty thousand as net defined benefit assets, we must carry out this test. What the test is saying is this. The amount to be recognized by the entity as retirement benefits assets should not be more than what the entity can enjoy in the future periods by way of reduction in the contribution to the plan assets. based on the defined benefits plan or scheme and the requirements of the law of the jurisdiction. Because some jurisdiction give you minimum amount you must contribute any year, regardless of whatever you call your actuarial valuation or portfolio valuation or anything. Okay, one, and or the amount that may be clawed back by clawed back or obtained by way of cash refunds from the plan assets. Invariably, what it means is that you will compare this net defined benefit asset of $50,000 with the present value of the future benefit associated with it with respect to one future reduction you have in your contribution. Two, any form of cash reform or benefit associated to it that will be to the benefit of the organization in the future. Let me now give you a practical example. If the present value of the benefit attributed to that, to the company will be $45,000 which as a measure at the present value. 
and the defined benefit asset as derived in this question is $50,000. It means you cannot recognize more than $45,000. What that means you need to write off $50,000 as part of measurement loss. As part of your what? Measurement what? Loss. Let's look at second scenario. What if the present value of future benefits associated with recovery or reduction in future contribution associated with that asset is $60 million? But what you actually have is $50 million. Therefore, you have to now take the actual value of the asset, which is $50 million, which means you pick the lower of the net defined benefit asset and the present value associated with such asset that is to the benefit of the entity in the future. And that is what it is. Any difference that is written off in that regard will be taken as part of the net actual gain or loss arising from the remeasurement of the plan assets and the plan obligation. And that is that. I believe I've explained that clearly. If not, I want somebody to call my attention to that. Any clarification? And if you want to see that clarification, as we have discussed it here, I will take you back to the material, our notes, which we discussed earlier in the day. If you remember, we discussed something on asset ceiling. Uh, I think you've passed it. Okay, we've passed it. Yes. Okay. Okay, this asset ceiling. Can somebody read it further again to emphasize what I've just discussed? Asset ceiling. Okay, sir. Yes. Yeah. When we looked at the recognition of the net defined benefit liability or assets in the statement of financial position. At the beginning of section five, sorry, I have to take it again. Someone distracted me. When we looked at the recognition of the net defined benefits liability or assets in the statement of financial position at the beginning of section five, the term asset ceiling was mentioned. The term relates to a treasury established by IES 19 to ensure that any defined benefit asset, that is a pension surplus, is carried at no more than its recoverable amount. In simple terms, this means that any net asset is restricted to the amount of cash savings that will be available to the entity in future. Okay, does that explain it? Now, can you refer that on net defined benefit assets? Okay. A net defined benefit asset may arise if the plan has been overfunded or if actuarial gains have arisen. This meets the definition of an asset as stated in the conceptual framework because all of the following apply. A, the entity controls a resource, the ability to use the surplus to generate future benefits. B, the control is, is the result of past events contributions paid by the entity and service rendered by the employee. C, future benefits are valuable to the entity in the form of a reduction in future contributions or a, or a cash refund, either directly or indirectly to another plan in deficit. The asset ceiling is the present value of those future benefits. The discount rate used in the is the same as that used to calculate the net interest on the net defined benefit liability or asset. The net defined benefit asset will be reduced to the asset ceiling threshold. Any related write down will be treated as a remeasurement and recognized in other comprehensive income. If the, asset, yeah, continue. if the asset ceiling adjustment was needed in a subsequent year, the changes in its value will be treated as follows. A, interest 
as it is a discounted amount recognized in profit or loss as part of the net interest amount. B, other, other changes recognized in profit or loss. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay, now let me now provide solution to the question, which is what I try to do. Now, the first one is we provided this information. Okay, solution B, which is the present value. Solution C. Solution D and E. Now, does this answer your question? Now, the first thing is to list out your Adria assumptions. Okay, we fair valued it. Thereafter, we fair valued the plan asset, we fair valued the plan liabilities. We determine the pension expense that will be reported to profit or loss for each of those years. Okay, and we determine the net loss or gain, net loss or gain. I have to update this, it's net loss or gain.
net loss of gain on measurement of defined benefit plan and the net retirement benefit obligation or assets. And where we discuss on the asset ceiling test. Okay, finally, in our discussion, you know, we have looked at only two out of the four. Let me show you where we started from. We started from We started from these two, short-term employee benefits, and we just wrapped up post-employment benefits. Now, somebody will now say, since morning, <laughs> when are we now going to finish the other two? The beauty of the other two is that it's very straightforward. How? Oh, other long-term benefits share similar treatment with post-employment because of the time value of money and the issue of actuarial assumption. But the difference between other long-term benefits and post employment is that the actual assumptions is not as complicated. And likewise, there's limitation in the recognition of differences in other competitive income as it relates to remeasurement. And we're going to discuss that. And very straightforward is the termination benefit, which we have also discussed at the beginning, how to separate termination benefit from every other benefit, be it short-term, post-employment, or other long-term. Now, we will be wrapping up in the next five minutes or more with our discussion on the underlying accounting for other long-term benefits. How do you account for other long-term benefits? As I've said earlier, we are going to account for it in similar vein with what we have done with uh, sorry, Mr. Muiwa. Yes, sorry. sir. Please can we just continue with other accounting for other long-term benefits? You know, we are to break our fast. Okay. Uh, what's going to happen is that we have just five minutes to wrap it up. Sorry for that. Now, to fast track it based on what we have discussed, okay? Shagun, can you read this and let us summarize it? Okay, sir. Accounting for other long-term benefits. IES 19 defines other long-term employee benefits as all employee benefits other than short-term employee benefits, post-employee benefits and termination benefits, if not expected to be settled only before 12 months after the end of the annual reporting period in which the employees rendered the related service. The type of benefits that might fall into this category includes long-term paid absence, such as sabbatical leave, profit sharing and bonuses, and long-term disability benefits. There are many similarities between these types of benefits and defined benefits pensions. For example, in a long-term bonus plan, the employees may provide service over a number of periods to earn their entitlement to a payment at a later date. In some cases, the entity may put cash aside or invest it in some way, perhaps by taking out an insurance policy to meet the liabilities when they arise as there is normally far less uncertainty relating to the measurement of this benefit, IS-19 requires a simpler method of accounting for them. Unlike the accounting method for post-employment benefits, this method does not recognize remeasurement in other comprehensive income. The entity should recognize all of the following in profit or loss, service costs, net interest on the defined benefit liability or assets, See remeasurement of the defined benefits, liability, or assets. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Now that is how to do it. That's why I said we are not spending any time on this because we are going to treat it similarly to what we've done under post-employment. The only difference in it is that you are not going to be more rigorous as what we have done. And issue of remeasurement does not apply to a measurement accounting for it within other comprehensive income does not necessarily apply to other long-term benefit as it is reported in profit or loss. Okay, that is that, especially with respect to um, asset ceiling test does not come in in this manner as everything is taken through profit or loss immediately. Okay. I want you to read a little about actuarial assumption. Can you read a little about actuarial assumptions? I've mentioned it, I've made use of it, and I want you to summarize it for us to wrap it up. Okay, sir. Actuarial assumptions. Actuarial assumptions made should be unbiased and based on market expectations. Discount rates used should be determined by reference to market yields on high quality fixed interest corporate bonds. Actuary assumptions are needed to estimate the size of the future post-employment benefits that will be payable under a defined benefits plan. The main categories of actuary assumptions are as follows. A, demographic assumptions are about mortality rates before and after retirement, the rate of employment turnover, early retirement, claim rates under medical plan, plans for former employees, and so on. B, Financial assumptions include future salary levels, allowing for seniority and promotion as well as inflation, and the future rates of increase in medical costs, not just inflationary costs, cost rises, but also cost rises specific to medical treatment and to medical treatment required, and to medical treatment required given the expectation of longer average life expectancy. The standard requires actuary assumptions to be neither too cautious nor too imprudent. They should be unbiased. They should also be based on market expectations at the year end over the period during which the obligation will be settled. Thank you very much. And lastly, we want to talk about accounting for termination benefit, which is the last category. And this will be accounted for in similar way with short-term benefits as it's for due. But what is critical about it is what I've shared with you. Can somebody read it? Okay, I'll read, sir. Termination benefits. A termination benefit liability is recognized at the, early, at the earlier of the following dates. One, when the entity can no longer withdraw the offer of those benefits, additional guidance is provided on when the dates occur in relation to an employee's decision to accept an offer of benefits on termination. And as a result of an entity's decision to terminate an employee's employment. Two, when the entity recognizes cause for a restructuring under IES 37, provisions, contingent liabilities, and contingent assets, which involves the payment of termination benefits. Termination benefits are measured in accordance with the nature of employment employee benefit. That is, as an enhancement of other post-employment benefits, or otherwise as a short-term employee benefit or other long-term employee benefits, IES 19, IES 19. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much about that. Now we have come to a conclusive end on IS-19. IS-19 is area, one of the technical aspects of IFRS that most accountants avoid. 
okay, all because it comes with its own uniqueness with respect to bringing in actuarial valuation and some other things. And therefore, that's why you find out that many people run away from it. But you guys have provided yourself an avenue to have better understanding of this, which you will better appreciate in the future, especially for those that will no longer be operating in this country because we have much more of complexities in foreign land than in Nigeria when it comes to all of this. And another one that is as technical as this is the share-based payment, IFRS2, which I've already shared the document with you, that you perils. Now, as we wrap up, I want Shagun to wrap up with this. You know, we talked about asset held by long-term employee benefit fund, which is the portfolio of assets. What are the nature of assets? What are the qualities in such an asset that make it unique? from the asset of the company. Can you read this? Yes, sir. Assets held by a long-term employee benefit fund are assets other than non-transferable financial instruments issued by the reporting entity. That's A, are held by an entity, a fund that is legally separate from the reporting entity and exists solely to pay or fund employee benefits. And B, are available to be used only to pay or fund employee benefits are not available to the reporting entity's own creditors, even in bankruptcy, and cannot be returned to the reporting entity unless either one, the remaining assets of the fund are sufficient to meet all the related employee benefit obligations of the plan or the reporting entity, or two, the assets are returned to the reporting entity to reimburse it for employee benefits already paid. Thank you very much. Okay, that is how we describe plan assets other than acceptable insurance policies, which I have defined earlier. And that's why when you come back here to when we define our plan assets, you find out that all of these qualify as long-time assets, okay? Where do we describe them? I think we'll give example of those assets here. Okay, you can see that all of these assets qualifies, shares, bonds, treasury bills and money market instruments, real estate investment trust, unit trust, ETFs other than edge funds that are highly volatile or derivative contracts that are highly volatile and also other acceptable investments. Okay, and that is that in that regard. Okay, now um, we've closed for the day and we have ended and make justice to IS-19. Um, and um, I want you to make reference to this table that summarizes your accounting entries to all what we have done today, okay? How you record your opening balances, your interest cost, your interest on plan asset, interest on plan obligation, your current service cost, your contribution, your benefits, your past service cost, your gain or loss on settlement, your measurement, actual gain or losses, both on asset and plan obligation. And finally, what you need to disclose with respect to the standard. And on this premise, uh, I appreciate you guys and uh, we'll call it a day, a night. We started around 10.30 and we are ending around 7.30. This has been marvelous, even though we had breaks in between, but this is enough to be appreciated for the effort we have put together. If there's no other question, Thank you very much, and God bless you guys. Thank, Thank you very much, much, sir. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, Bye-bye.